want to thank everybody for coming. I'm just going to give a very quick, short introduction, uh, and then we're going to have a really interesting discussion afterwards. Um, one thing I just wanted to say, this, I think this is a very important book, and um, you know, it reminds me of the word colleagues, you know, and what that means. Um, it's authored by three people who are here. Four, sorry, excuse me. Fact check. Uh, <laughs> one, did, one couldn't make it. Uh, and more importantly, uh, holds a whole body of work uh, of, of maybe a, a generation with a point of view or a series of point of views. And I think it attempts to create a platform for that voice. And it's very complicated, very nuanced, and it's full of many, many voices. And it, 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 to me, it, it is the essence of what collegiality is or what a colleague is. I find that very interesting. And there's not many groups of architects that have been able to do that. So I think that's really special. So I want to introduce Christy Ballier first, who will introduce the rest of the panel, because she, of course, is a faculty member here at SciArc. And uh, I want to kick it off with her. Thank you, yep. and thank you all for coming. Christy. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm certainly pleased uh, to be here tonight uh, to present uh, the Possible Mediums Project and to more importantly to present sort of a set of relationships. Um, but before I begin, I of course would like to thank Hernan and John for offering the library for this venue uh, this evening in order to have this event to celebrate with all of you. Um, I'd also like to, of course, whenever any event happens at this school, there's a whole support system behind that that I am indebted to. I'd like to specifically thank uh, Stephanie and Maraja for their help in um, pulling together um, this, this event here. And finally, in terms of the thank yous, there were uh, a few students who were invaluable in helping me to uh, set up this uh, exhibition this evening. Uh, the first one is Gun Zizawat, and then Zihan Gao, and Keita Saito. I'd like, thank you. Everyone that's in this room understands that any project at any scale takes a lot of hands, and I appreciate theirs. So while the headline tonight is the publication, I have been challenged, or charged rather, to set the scene, or perhaps the behind the scenes. That'll be followed by a brief definition of how we've invented and defined mediums, followed by a brief description of the book. So for us, The Possible Mediums is a series of events showcasing design investigations based in speculative architectural mediums and is organized by Kelly Baer, Adam Fure, Kyle Miller, and myself. I'm joined tonight for this presentation by Kyle Miller, um, who is an assistant professor at Syracuse University, and also by my partner, Imbert Ballier, an associate professor and director of the graduate program at UIC, the University of Illinois, Chicago. And while the conversations and while the conversations and initial observations and copious amount of organization that it takes to put together a work were shared between the four of us, it is important, it is important beyond all else that we acknowledge the many contributors that participated in the various capacities along the way. Many are in this room, including Anna Niemark, uh, David Freeland, um, there may be others from here in Los Angeles, although I didn't see them, but there's a handful um, of our peers that practice and teach here in Los Angeles, um, including many others, which Kelly will talk about in a minute. So how did the Pro Possible Mediums Project um, begin? I, I think it, it really became by all of us beginning to see an expanding ambition to develop fresh formal and aesthetic trajectories within our peers' practices and in the way that they were teaching. And what we were seeing at this time was kind of an elaborate use of technical virtuosity that was now being used to produce draped lumps, slumping podiums, snuggling forms, fringed edges, prickled pink surfaces, I think what you're noticing here is what it became important and what we're beginning to realize is that the qualifier 
was really important and that the field was really diversifying. It was no longer that you were working on a surface project or that you were working on an envelope project, but it, the qualifier, the type, the what you were working on specifically became important. We began to see things like cartoons and narratives being played, played out by furniture, an intense interest in the development of character, one that seemed to not always even need people. We saw that machines were being used to test limits and were, um, were seen almost as a peer as opposed to something that would just make our jobs more efficient. We began to see that dancing, dancing machines, molding machines um, were beginning to participate increasingly in architecture. And in, in infinite vector fields were generously populating our screens and requiring an enormous amount of editing, and aggregates were dominant across the field. So finally, after having several conversations among the four of us, trying to understand this kind of range, this sort of expanding field, essentially we essentially wanted to selfishly wanted to understand this shifting terrain, these expanding mediums, and more importantly, we wanted to know the people that were working on them. So as a first effort, as part of the Possible Mediums project, we organized um, the Possible Mediums conference, which um, interestingly enough was hosted uh, six years ago this week. Okay, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, we should wave to Adam if he's watching at home also. Um, so as Christine mentioned, one of the things that we did right off the bat was to convene people in the form of a conference. The challenges that we faced really centered around how to bring together and organize in a meaningful way all of these different formal and aesthetic tendencies that we saw popping up, uh, let's say primarily at schools in the Midwest, but let's say throughout the country. Um, the curious list that we encountered, so all of the things that, that Christy just introduced, reminded us of another curious list, one that Michel Foucault references in the preface uh, within a seminal text of his, The Order of Things. Uh, this list includes things like suckling pigs, sirens, uh, and that those that from a long way off look like flies. So for us, um, as probably was the case for Foucault, in the absence of a stable foundation upon which all of these entities, so for us, architectural projects and for Foucault animals, uh, can be ordered, um, existed an opportunity to confront these objects outright before systems of classification and order is imposed. Um, and we, came, we became quite excited about the possibility that these things, these objects, held as much sway as the thoughts and theories that preceded him or that they oftentimes um, are surrounded by. Um, this is something we indicate in the preface, um, but also something that uh, we were allowed to kind of act on in this conference, uh, which became a venue for us to test out this provocation. So the conference um, was our first attempt at beginning to organize what we were calling possible mediums for architecture. Uh, we brought together at Ohio State 120 students from four different schools. Um, there was four mediums at the time, active models, tactile objects, excessive volumes, and I missed one more, figural projections. Um, so those four categories were then um, assigned to basically the 12 workshop leaders and we began to work through what we, f we felt were kind of these underlying support structures that were popping up uh, across these practices. Um, so we, uh, we had these 12 workshops occurring simultaneously all in one space. It was totally amazing and a big mess. Um, students were working with uh, these uh, offices and these young architects as a way to really kind of think through the things that they were actively engaging in their office. It wasn't a kind of typical master class model, I do this, you do as I do. It was a kind of in, in real time formation of a lot of these thoughts. We interrupted the workshops with four uh, panel discussions and I think for the first time really tried to formalize the discourse surrounding a lot of these projects. Um, and concluded the, the four day event with a walk through uh, where Jeffrey Kibnis and John McMurrow kind of quickly helped us to diagnose what had occurred uh, over the past four days. So the conference was then followed by a series of uh, additional events. At one point we speculated on possible, what possible mediums university might look like. I proposed that it take place in Panama City Beach, but I was rejected. Uh, and we concluded with uh, a book. So we, f we feel that this book is our, our kind of last collaborative endeavor. 
Um, and by no means something that uh, concludes the project, though. Uh, and I think that's something that, that Kelly will address uh, as we move forward. So the book um, is full of contributions from many, many, many people, um, some who are in this room, supported by all of our institutions, uh, and as well um, supported through the copy editing efforts of Courtney Kaufman and the design of Sean Yendris. The book for us then, uh, we write, presents a collection of 16 speculative design mediums by emerging architects. And the book is organized in such a way to help define these mediums uh, and fill uh, the pages with images that help to define them visually as well. So the book for us then is about collecting, organizing, and sharing new work primarily, uh, defining speculative mediums or what we might call conceptual support structures, borrowing from Krauss, and suggesting conduct through the development of convention. So quite literally uh, suggesting the way in which uh, a method may emerge that uh, includes the way one might bring in an abstract entity into the discipline of architecture and develop a rule set around its use. Uh, regarding inventing mediums, then again, a key aspect of the book for us, we, we again referred to Krauss as a way to kind of broaden the traditional definition of medium, which we uh, generally understand to be tied to a physical substance. Krauss posits that, in fact, uh, we could think about a medium as a, a logic rather than a form of matter. This really resonated with us. It's something that uh, she writes about in her book, Under Blue Cup, uh, as well as uh, does Michael Fried when he comments on the work of Frank Stella. So this example for us uh, is a, where we might imagine that Stella is not indebted in this moment to the discipline of painting nor to sculpture, but in fact suggests that shape is the thing that's being worked on uh, and is the thing conceptually that sits underneath work that transcends multiple traditional mediums. Um, the important thing for us then was to think about how what typically took place over centuries could take place much more rapidly. And so this notion of bringing in from the outside an abstract entity and developing a rule set around it was a way for us to kind of confidently propose that these could be speculative mediums for architecture. And we arrived at 16. So my job is to talk about the book specifically. Um, but before I do that, every time we do one of these book launches, we tell a different story about possible medium's origins. Uh, Kyle told a, a false report I in New know. York, uh, and we've since not allowed him to talk about the origins. That's why uh, Christy did it. But I think we also, or I think we would all agree that the actual birthplace of possible mediums is Los Angeles, uh, circa 2000, early 2000s, um, where we were students uh, and then ultimately were getting our feet wet as practitioners um, and also professors before we went on to uh, places in the middle, at least for a, a while for some of us. Um, so back to the book, um, we saw the book as a coupling of disciplined order with the informal frenzy of the earlier events. But as we know, live action events are very different from books. Um, so the question was, how do we convey that tone in a print format? Uh, how can we project order in a book that really can be read in any order? It's effectively orderless. And how do 208 pages featuring 42 people and 71 projects hold together cohesively uh, when spread across 16 different uh, paper types, all white? Um, and Kyle laid out, I think, pretty well what the book is. Uh, but it might be helpful to, to also clarify what it's not. Um, this has come up a few times, so we'll address it. But um, we never saw the book as a technical know-how or how-to, um, nor did we see it as a collection of instructional recipes, but rather as a means to describe the ways in which one works on something uh, in an exhaustive way. Though I think the four of us would certainly agree that the list of these 16 mediums uh, that were up before uh, is not exhaustive. So the book is structured in three parts, um, and I'm going to jump around on this page a little bit, but the middle section uh, is the, the kind of 16 chapters on medium. Uh, and the four of us set out to offer definitions of each of the mediums through our own writing um, and some excellent copy editing from Courtney uh, so that we sounded like one person instead of four. Um, and then second, uh, these definitions were bolstered or in many cases even challenged uh, by guest essays that we solicited from various authors. Uh, some of those authors have work in the chapters and others do not. They're kind of external or periphery to the, uh, to the work in the book. Um, and then lastly, uh, the preface, the prelude, and the afterword 
uh, were by some of our favorite critics and also the people that just seem to keep showing up to our events, uh, uninvited or otherwise. Um, John McMurrow wrote the slightly cutting prelude, um, which is a <laughs> really good intro, um, and then the ever uh, optimistic uh, afterward was done by Dora Epstein Jones. Um, so the the book um, we had also seen as uh, a sort of collection of proto architectures. So there are no books featured. Sorry, <laughs> there are no buildings featured in the book. There are also no books featured in the book. Um, and this was intentional, as the book has always been more about communicating an ethos about how abstract themes inform one's work and how mediums can be thought of as something that gets worked on versus the more traditional sense of the word medium. Um, so we took an excerpt from the book uh, and kind of gratuitously we took one uh, that's pretty close to the work that Christy and I have been working on for the past uh, couple of years. Um, but just as a, a kind of sample of, of the way we treat each of these mediums, uh, the first is to, to kind of make a declaration or a statement, um, so define the particular term, the medium. And then the second thing was to uh, begin to kind of explain uh, the characteristics or the traits. Uh, so what do these projects, how are they invested in working on this particular medium? Um, and then just to show a couple of uh, examples, um, so this is a project of Christy and I's uh, working on the medium of lines. Um, here is material simulators, hence in the case, or here in the case of a digital weave or a knot, um, or lines that manifest themselves in three dimensions by adapting traits of two-dimensional drawing conventions, such as weight and type, um, or the work of Kyle Reynolds and McLean Clutter, uh, empty pavilion that looks, as li looks at lines as figural tracings. Um, and then uh, the work of sports, a project called Rounds, which simultaneously dials up the line as a spatial volume, uh, ironically by flattening it in one direction. And then lastly, Bitter Tangs, uh, Burrow Burrow, which does a bit of all of the above, as they tend to do, um, though looks to multiplicity and excessive material qualities in the line to produce uh, habitable spaces. Um, and then just to, to kind of end, um, and maybe end with a projection. Um, the question often comes up, what's next uh, for possible mediums? Um, currently, we're each testing the books, kind of kicking the tires on the book's pedag uh, pedagogical impact in different ways, uh, from Kyle and Christie seminars to studios that I've been teaching here and abroad, and in Adam's case, uh, through an expansion of the workshop model through academic and public programming. Um, and then even, I think, I would say, uh, Anna Niemark's uh, new seminar, Impossible Mediums. Is this true? Thesis Lab, Thesis lab uh, which is a great title. Um, so while we see the book as, the, as kind of the final installment uh, for the project, uh, we've enjoyed watching the fallout from it, both in terms of the academy and the profession. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Marceline Gao. Uh, she's principal of Servo Los Angeles, as well as the coordinator of the design theory and pedagogy program here at SciArc, um, which we thought was particularly fitting for her role here tonight, uh, which is to shed a little bit of light on the book. pleasure uh, to be here with my colleagues, um, whom I respect so much, for uh, producing this project, producing this book, um, and bringing us all together to actually speak about it, because I think that is um, the major impetus behind this more than anything. Um, I think as you pointed out, it's not a primer, it's not uh, something that others will follow visually and sort of a set of instructions for producing something, but it's really a provocation for, for thought and for discourse and for the next generation coming up who many of you are in the room. Um, so I thought, you know, it, it's kind of funny, I could have called this section of the uh, talk Understanding Mediums after Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, but um, here we have mediums. Um, and McLuhan, there's a, a little quote from him that I'd like to kick off with. Uh, he says, it is the artist's job, and I would insert architect there, to try to dislocate older media into postures that permit attention to the new. 
To this end, the artist must ever play and experiment with new means of arranging experience, even though the majority of his audience may prefer to remain fixed in their old perceptual attitudes. And so I think that thing of creating postures, positions, um, really is the uh, kind of motivating force behind the initial set of workshops and also um, what we see presented in the book. And so, you know, it, architecture as a practice, as we all know, necessitates acts of translation from drawing to model, from model to building, from BIM file to rendering uh, to set of HVAC documents to CDs. Um, constantly, the architectural project resides in a multiplicity of mediums. And to that end, it's kind of fundamental as one shifts between these mediums, each one will, to some extent, retain or lose a degree of specificity, a degree of information. And there's a certain kind of thing that's deemed appropriate for one medium that might not be for another medium. Um, and so those different kind of aspects of the architectural project um, kind of you know, conspire to present us with a given, um, a given reality. So thus, the architect must employ a degree of generalization um, in the interest of enhancing legibility. There are certain shared codes that connect these mediums um, in order for things to be compared and assessed and to understand why one project is significantly different from another and why that difference actually makes a difference. Um, and so therefore, I was, I was very pleased and, uh, <laughs> and when I saw the reference to um, the, the so-called, uh, let's see what it's officially called, the Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge, which is that certain Chinese encyclopedia um, that was shown a moment ago with the different categories of um, every creature in the, in the empire. Um, and of course, as Michel Foucault points out, using Borges' taxonomy, uh, that this is the way, there's a sort of somewhat arbitrariness to the way that we order things, the way that we structure knowledge. Um, it's necessary to work with these kind of thresh thresholds, differences, um, and I think as we look at the images suspended above our heads in this space, one can begin to meditate on that and think, you know, where do certain, um, where do certain artifacts align with one another and where do they actually present very different worldviews? And so I, I think also just the staging of this whole event is really provocative in terms of the, <laughs> the deck of cards, as it were, that's laid before us um, to consider that. And so um, the the kind of, you know, and again, Foucault talks about this, this ordering as uh, kind of the fundamental codes that a culture uses um, to deal with schemas of perception, language, um, techniques, the hierarchy of practices, scientific theories, um, and architecture, of course. And so one could ask, you know, within what space of order knowledge becomes constituted. And so that's why I think that the whole issue of the um, collection as you presented in the book of these disparate practices, disparate ways of working, but certain shared sensibilities, certain moments of overlap, certain moments of friction. Um, I think that is something that you know, I, would, I would unpack and start to look at as, you know, is this a map of different practices or does this become an instrument? I would argue that it becomes an instrument. Um, and something that, you know, I, the reason I was so pleased to see the taxonomy, I actually, um, in some of my history theory seminars, have kicked off uh, a discussion of contemporary practices and theories in architecture by looking at that taxonomy, and then by looking at a text um, that was written by Alejandro Zarapolo in 1998 for an issue of El Croqui. The text is called A World Full of Holes. Um, he talks about, you know, to some consternation, being invited um, by the editors of El Croqui to uh, produce a map of contemporary global practice at this moment in 1998. And he sort of ruminates on this and thinks, you know, what would be the use of making such a map unless it became an instrument, unless it revealed niches for action and operation? and sort of revealed where, um, you know, where certain terrain has been covered and where 
other terrain opens up new possibilities. And so he speaks of this map as an active instrument. And I believe that the, the publication, as I went through it and, and was reading it, I was really thinking about um, that question that Sarah Polo raised. And I think that your contribution really is not to produce a kind of manifesto of plurality um, or to sort of spell that out or diagram that out, but rather to provoke us to ask where we insert ourselves. Um, within this, so that each, so the next generation of, of students, of young faculty, um, really thinking about where the contribution can fit. Um, so, I, I would argue that, um, you know, working with through the difference between it's something else that that comes up in in Zarapolo's text is is the issue of, of research. And often the research and practice dichotomy um, is presented as something, uh, two extreme ends um, of a spectrum. But I would say there are different kinds of research, um, disciplinary research, extradisciplinary research. And in fact, um, one thing that Zarapolo considers is what tools do we use and to what effects do we use them? So do we use tools that come from within our discipline in order to create extradisciplinary effects? Or do we want to use disciplinary tools and produce disciplinary effects? Or do we use extradisciplinary tools to produce extradisciplinary effects? And I think we see that range on the pages of the book. Um, and so I just, to end, I, I, you know, taking, for instance, the line, as you presented, it's coincidental because I had written here, you know, consider the line as a fundamental architectural entity. The line, for example, has no dimension without the specific medium in which it is delineated. The medium, in the sense that I use it here, includes not only the physical aspects of a project's instantiation, but more importantly, the disciplinary lineage within which each project positions itself the discourses engaged by each project and the audiences to whom it is addressed become the specific mediums in which the project resides. And I think, you know, now I would sort of turn uh, maybe to a few questions to kind of uh, follow up on that. And, and, you know, as we saw, you have um, enumerated your, your taxonomy, you know, bodies, graphics, narratives, stacks, volumes, to name a few. Um, that are all spelled out around us. And again, a very spatializing uh, operation of this sort of ordering system in the room. Like literally the writing is on the walls, the images are on the walls. I, th I think that's really um, not you know, incidental the way that you, that you uh, set that up. And so I'd like to return again to the issue of uh, the pedagogy of this as a kind of instrument for teaching or for teaching teachers how to teach. Um, unlike an abecedarium, which is a book used to teach the alphabet, a kind of rote learning, copying the letters, um, memorizing, I see this as a set of provocations to, to action, to kind of to hand over a project and to say, okay, how does the next generation begin to swerve something that's being worked on? So could one of you maybe speak to that a little bit? Um, I think one of the things that has always resonated for me is the way in which these mediums are uh, kind of more nuanced versions of things that we might to be understand to be more timeless or traditional mediums, so form, space, and order. So I think the one thing that I've, I've always done is um, tried to understand how these still work on kind of core disciplinary sets of knowledge and then it, it enhance or expand the way that techniques can be developed to work on those core issues. So I think all of them, uh, while avoiding the ambition to be emulated, I think suggest that if those key things remain underneath all of the work, form, space, and order, that this becomes a kind of ethos for how one can pull something from an abstract realm, discipline it, and allow it to make a contribution back to these knowledge sets. And so in that, in that case, I've always thought about it actually primarily as a pedagogical thing, much more so than it is a, a kind of marker of new work. Uh, I think it does that as well, but I think it has tremendous pedagogical value that probably hasn't fully played out yet. Yeah. I would maybe add that I think that the 
um, as hopefully we hinted to, the kind of development of this project was happening in parallel to the development of our, let's say, young practices, even though young is used for a really long time in architecture. Um, and I think that it was really important that, I think initially it wasn't necessarily thought of as pedagogic as much as it was, we were a generation that had been taught about a lot about like technical virtuosity and being able to kind of control a certain set of techniques. Um, and that was paramount. And I think as we began to develop our careers, I think it became really important to be more specific about how we were harnessing those tools. And so I think that there was a need to not only define how we were using those tools, which I think in our education was really, really important, I think it became also increasingly important to be able to describe why we were using, what it was we were working on. Um, and I think that, I, I guess I see that then now as a pedagogic tool to to a generation that has you know, exponentially even more decisions to make in terms of how they make things, what they use, and why they're doing it, that I think just a book that in a, for a moment just asks one, a student, a practitioner, however, to be kind of intentional about their ambitions. Um, and I think that that is increasingly important as, um, as our capacity to produce increases. Yeah, I would just add, um, having just taught a studio that kind of uh, sampled a few of these chapters and asked the students to play them out uh, explicitly not in the way that they were represented in the book, um, offered a, a view of the book that was more of not just like a launching point for their work, but like a way of actually pivoting um, around or between uh, mediums. So there, there started to be a kind of uh, hybridization of things and in some ways like new emergent um, mediums from that work and I think as a when I was in school when we were in school I remember pouring over um, around Alasha's tooling uh, I think it was a pamphlet was it a pamphlet um, which was recipe based right and kind of following the steps to kind of get the desired effect with, with variability though kind of always within that particular recipe and set of ingredients and I think despite possible mediums always being uh, thought of as a kind of open source, like no trade secrets um, kind of project, uh, there is a resistance to showing like particular technique or kind of prescription um, in terms of how one would actually produce uh, the work in the book. So I think it, it opens it up a little bit um, beyond the, the technique. And also I think the, the uh, kind of connection back to the events that transpired and the book is something that, you know, that time has passed and it's sort of an edited, um, well, it actually doesn't present the workshops per right. se. So the things that we're seeing in the book, parts of them have been, were produced possibly, I'm not sure this question, at the workshops and then others um, are things that came out of it after or how? I mean, I think, I think it's one of the, that's all, those are all true because I think part of what has been enabled is a kind of entanglement of all of these different emerging uh, tendencies. And so it, it's not really about claiming, claiming ownership over one of these nuanced territories, but introducing it and opening it up to let others uh, kind of engage it in their own ways. And so I think there's certainly projects in the book that are, let's say, directly related to efforts that were put forth in the workshop and others maybe more indirectly just through kind of subconscious influence given that these things are all shared as works in progress. And I mean does the book sort of set out criteria for evaluating you know as one would in a brief when we have a sort of learning objectives and I mean there the way that it is laid out with the definitions it seems that there is a bit of that kind of um, establishing a criteria for how, what is the threshold for how we define these uh -huh. particular ways of operating? Yeah, I think, I mean, to look back here, I think one of the things that we were very careful to do was to not uh, push everything towards a kind of result. And so everything's a kind of in-process capture. Um, and so things like thickness, curvature, continuity, and spacing aren't necessarily ways in which one could evaluate a project that's interested in lines, but in fact, a set of things that, qualities that one might consider. So I think like the effects of all of this work is probably not something that's included in the book as we might understand effects of 
architecture to be. So all of these things, as Kelly mentioned, kind of precede acts of building uh, and acts of being responsible in different ways than, than this stuff plays out. And I think the, yeah, the, the sort of exclusion of what we would conventionally consider to be buildings um, is also very provocative because it's, it's really demanding us to kind of scrutinize, even as I sit and look at the cards in front of me on the table, to scrutinize and think, okay, this, these belong to certain categories that are being called out. Um, they're inherently architectural. Mm -hmm. And then I start to, okay, so it, how and why? And I really, it, it provokes my thought to become very precise about what architecture is. Yeah. And so I think rather than being able to kind of gloss over um, the conventional representation of what we would say is, you know, that's clearly a building, then that's when, you know, maybe we, we don't scrutinize in the same way. And so you're really presenting and kind of bracketing things out for our consideration mm -hmm. that are very precise. And in some ways I even, you know, I, I often, um, speak about minutia as things that become very important, that minutia sounds like kind of minor differences, but they're everything, they're fundamental to how we position ourselves um, in our discipline. Yeah, I think that's a super important question, particularly for now um, a set of practices that definitely want to produce and put buildings into the world. So it's really important that the takeaway from this book is not that this is architecture and buildings are not architecture or or you know vice versa. But I think it's it it was a very conscious decision, even though I think what did you say, like one third of the practices in the book now are building, like have buildings under construction since the, the conference has started. Um, the, and we had to kind of edit and intentionally not include those projects because it is, in a way, we actually thought it would sort of narrow the ways people could read into the speculative mediums because a building in many, many ways has many of those mediums included within it, right? And that a singular, you couldn't design an entire building through the lens of a kind of a singular ambition or through the precise working on a particular medium. But I think maybe that also gets us close to the pedagogic tool or even how you work as a young practice. Like it's, you kind of, if you can get a precise way of working in a singular aspect, that can then contribute to the decisions that need to be made for the next phase of the project. Right, and that I think that this book is sort of advocating for that level of attention um, and precision in terms of how you're thinking and working, and that that would then translate into the scale um, of architecture in building. Yes. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think just even uh, again looking across the room and seeing um, you know plans, puzzles, stacks, the way in which the things are defined and then coupled with the uh, image of the project is a very particular way of um, defining. It's an act of defining. And, and to me, that is really a, a sort of, that produces the toolkit with which we then, um, then produce other architectures. Yeah, the, I mean, the definitions were written very specifically, basically to identify the noun and suggest its potential effects. And then the keywords in the book are all the things that bridge those two things together. So I think all the kind of potential effects of these conceptual support structures, I think, are almost to be determined. And we very much li like that, that, that the, the end result of these has not been defined. And that's where we kind of pass it over to others as they pick up the book.